He was an Army National Service commando fighter. When he was a university student in NUS, he founded ACRES, A-C-R-E-S, which stands for Animal Concerns Research and Education Society, uh, an animal welfare charity. Uh, he still runs ACRES as its CEO. In 2015, he was elected as a member of parliament for Nisun GRC. Louis Zeng, welcome to Inconvenient Questions. Thank you so much for inviting me, Bisho. Thank you. Let's go to the, my first question. How did you become so interested in animal welfare? You said, and I quote you, we don't need everyone in Singapore to love animals, but we need to build a sense of justice. What exactly does it mean and how did you get drawn into this space? So I've, I've always loved animals since I was young, but the, the turning point really came almost 20 years ago when I was volunteering at the zoo and I was um, at the chimp section. We used to put baby chimps on your lap to take photos and I was actually the photographer. And I got very close to one chimp called Ramba, uh, who was used for photography, but behind the scenes, they were treating her pretty badly. I mean, when she misbehaved, they used to grab her by her head and punch her in the face. And oh, no. at one point, she ran to me, she hugged me, and she did this to check whether her lips was bleeding. And that, that changed me. I mean, that was in 1999, if I'm not wrong. Time flies, but um, I spoke wow. up. Uh, the zoo fired me. Uh, somehow, the straight sums believed in my story. They published it. Um, after about two or three years of campaigning, we succeeded. And the zoo invited me back to witness the release of Ramba because they took Ramba away from her mother when she was about a year old. So about two, three years, she never saw her mother. Maybe a glimpse, maybe could smell her, never touched her. But I think to all our amazement and perhaps horror as well, uh, when they opened the gates, Ramba ran straight to her mother. Wow. It hugged, you know. And that, that for me, I was, I was a little boy back then uh, as an undergrad in NUS. And that was... Amazing that they didn't see each other for so long, separated at such a young age, but they obviously missed each other and knew each other. And that was actually the Straight Sums photo with a caption, Rumba reunited with Susie. And that changed my life because I realized if I could speak up, fight for these changes, devote my life towards doing this, then I could save more lives and make a bigger difference. That's amazing. That's an amazing story. Thank you for sharing that. You know. um, and, and, and so what are some of the things that Acres has done? Uh, so we, we don't really focus on rescuing dogs and cats, but really focus on something we call industrialized animal cruelty, where cruelty goes on behind the scenes and not many people are aware about it. And that's why we want to make sure that justice is served. Same with photography chimps. Uh, people always thought that the little babies look so happy taking the photos, but mm-hmm. you know, in my whole career there, there was only one lady who asked, actually, where's Ramba's mother? But everybody else thought, so cute, take a photo. Uh, there's things like wildlife trade, uh, illegal pet trade. Um, these are issues that we raise where not many people are very familiar with, but we hope that if we can show them what goes on behind the scenes, then they can make a more informed decision. So that's where research and education in Acres, right? Yes. A lot of emphasis on research and education. So that the emphasis is not really on the rescue part. It's really yeah. about changing mindsets. And that's mm. why we, we go out on, on our 24-7 rescue services every day to not just pick up animals, but to really change the mindset that actually it's, it's a monkey sitting across the road. It's okay. Just don't stare at the monkey. Uh, when the monkey is yawning, move further away. And we change mindsets on how we can coexist so that I, I've always said my wish is that before I die, there wouldn't be a need for an Acres Wildlife Rescue because. Center. Because and could, everybody could, would learn to coexist. Could you share, for example, something that's, that you'd consider insightful that most of us wouldn't even think about? that you learned or you, you, you sort of found out during uh, your, your years with Acres? I mean, throughout the, my, my whole career in advocacy, I've always believed and I hold it true that uh, once people become aware of the issues, they will start to take action. They will see the other side. And that's what happened with animal welfare. I think when we started almost 20 years ago with Acres, not many people knew about the issues that we were championing. As such, not many people donated to it as well. Yeah. I think we've managed to reach a stage where animal welfare is, is a social norm now. It is. Whenever it is. there's an injustice, people will speak up, people will write to foreign letters, uh, it goes crazy on social media. And yeah. I, I think we've reached this stage because social media has opened up information to everyone. Yes. And I think armed with the knowledge, uh, people yeah. do want to take action. And also, I think, I think even, even in Parliament, right, there's greater awareness and greater respect for this kind of uh, this space. Just out of curiosity, I mean, I'm being a bit mischievous here, right? Uh, you're a commando, right? Yep. During the National Service days. Now, we have survival training. Yep. So you must have actually killed 
pythons and and uh, and lizards and iguanas and so on. Uh, how do you reconcile that? Do you feel guilty? Absolutely guilty. They they made me kill a chicken. Chicken and, and, and we had to train. We, do, I always, do, during my time, it was python and and uh, the iguanas. You know, I, I didn't get arrowed uh, to do that one. <laughs> so so how did you? Chicken, I put the head off. We had to cook it, eat it, and then I. I had stomach ache for quite a few days, so it's payback. Yeah. The, the other question that some people had, you know, is that, uh, wait a minute, why did Louis Ng decide to set up his own acres? He could have actually chosen to, uh, he could have chosen to work with SPCA, for example, and, and built in, contributed by, by building in research and, and, and education into SPCA. Why, why set up your own? Uh, is it that you have a big ego? Is it that you, you want to go out there and be, your, be a master of your own empire? These are questions that are asked. We really do. I mean, I wanted to. And if you look at the media uh, articles, I mean, back in 1999, 2001, unfortunately, I had to approach uh, the US group, um, IPPL, International Parliament, yeah, yeah. and the UK group, the World Society for Protection of Animals. And, and that's one reason why I set up my own organization here. I felt that I... Here, I, I was trying to fight an injustice, but I couldn't get the, the support in Singapore. And I had to go to England and to the America, to the US, to try and get support for something. Why, why I, couldn't you get the support in Singapore? You said, you, obviously, you tried. I think at that time, advocacy was at its infancy stage um, in Singapore. Not many people wanted or dared to speak up. And I think I, I couldn't get that support at that time. And that was one of the reasons why I wanted to set up Acres. Not just to fight for... Uh, the rights of animals, but I think more importantly, mobilize people to speak up, uh, to fight for what they believed in. And I think it worked. So after the Chim Photography campaign, um, the articles came out, uh, we got together. Obviously, I couldn't set up Acres on my own. And uh, actually, one of the first founding members of Acres was Eunice Lau, the, the Straits Times reporter who covered the story. Uh, we had Chandra Mohan to help us to draft the constitution. I think he was... Mm. Uh, Chandra Mohan Nair. Mm. And then we, wow. we started this synergy where a lot of people said, actually, I'm also interested in this issue. Actually, I also am. And we got together and that was... So it's actually a movement. Yes. It became a movement. That's what you wanted, right? At that now, point, as well, I mean, to clarify, SPCA was focused yeah. more on domestic animals, dogs and cats. Not, not your industrial animals, for and example. And there, there really wasn't any other group that was focusing on, say, wildlife, zoos, marine parks issue. Yeah, yeah. So... Um, you know, your advocacy style, uh, people who worked with you, you know, then and, and, and now say that, well, maybe, maybe because your blood was hot as a youngster, you know, you were pretty confrontational in your early style, you know, uh, confrontational, for example, in, in, I think, was it 2003 that the, the dolphins, you, you went all out against the Hopper group, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and can you tell us, you know, what, what made you take such an aggressive stance, especially in that campaign? I think started out, I was very hot-headed. I was very young, uh, very angry. You know, I wanted to fight and change this world overnight. <laughs> and so a lot of strategies was very confrontational. But I think it was around 2008 uh, where we sat down as a team and we, we sort of did a, an overview. Yes, we were very confrontational. We got a lot of media coverage, say the suffering not smiling campaign for the dolphins, uh, tremendous coverage. Yeah. But we sat down and realized, actually, what difference were we making? And I'm not out here to get publicity. I'm out here to try and effect the changes. And we realized that through confrontation, a lot of publicity, not much policy or actual changes on the ground. And so I told the team, let's try and, and switch a little bit, not a, a full turn, but instead of confrontational, let's try to collaborate, find middle ground, still confront, but try as far as we can to collaborate and find middle ground. And you would see around 08, we did a bit of shift in our strategy and that resulted in a lot of uh, changes, positive changes yeah. to the work that we did. Yeah. And, and would you say that that approach works better in a, in a political culture like in Singapore? You know, uh, you know, as opposed to the, the Greenpeace confrontation, it may work in some, some countries, in some societies, but in Singapore, uh, maybe that approach works better. You know, the, the, the finding common ground kind of approach. Do you think so from your experience? I think there's, there's room for all kinds of advocacy. But my own experience, I mean, in an Asian context, is that collaboration approach works much better, much faster, and it's more long-lasting the change. Right. And, and your experience in working with the Singapore TCM uh, 
committee, is it? Uh, National TCM Organization Committee, yep. right? Uh, has been, has proven to be very, very constructive and productive, is that the outcome? Could you, could you share with us your experience in working with them, which is a very different style from the Dolphins, right? Yep. So that was one of the um, our strategies. We still confronted the issue of TCM shops selling bear bow, tiger parts in Singapore. But at the same time, we wanted to collaborate. So we sat down with some of the partners, um, including some we got into trouble because when we went undercover, we caught them selling it. But we said, let's sit down. Let's see how we can work together. Let's show you what the alternatives are. There's over 60 different herbal alternatives to bear bow, for example. Uh, why don't you, when someone asks you for bear bow, you, and I'll give you this booklet, you can actually give these herbs instead. And why don't you work together on a labeling scheme so that we can identify the, the more progressive shops that are not selling these products. And that worked well. That was an example of how uh, we still confronted the issues, but we put on our collaboration head as well. And, and you gave, you came with, uh, with a solution. Yes. Right? And then we an put alternative. A label and we then urged people to go to these TCM shops that are part of the scheme that wouldn't sell endangered species products. Yeah. That's quite a coup, you know, I mean, to, to work with the TCM committee and, and national committee and, and get this going. And, and is it still the practice among the TCM uh, in TCM that they don't sell yes, I mean, I, I'm, animal products? I'm very happy. That, I mean, in 2001, I think the, I can still remember the stats, 73.5% of shops in Singapore sold bare bow. I, I dare say now it's zero. They wiped Wonderful. it out. Wonderful. The last now, and and, and let's, let's now segue from there to, to Parliament. You became an MP, you elected in 2015, right? Uh, and uh, under the Nisun GRC. And uh, you, you have, you've really uh, earned a reputation for yourself as, uh, as, a, as a big mouth in Parliament. <laughs> house fly. Uh, house fly, big mouth house fly, right? Uh, you spoke at, uh, in, 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 the, in the sitting, in, in the Parliament sitting from 2015 to, to 2020. Uh, you spoke um, at uh, 108 out of 128 sittings. You know, that's the statistics I got, 13th Parliament. You asked 293 parliamentary questions or what is known as PQs. You raised four adjournment motions. Uh, most notably, you achieved a policy shift of, of sorts through lobbying for equal, uh, equal public housing rights for uh, single parents, you know, which, which was quite a, quite a coup because I remember when I was a, a nominated member of parliament, this, this issue, in 2009, this issue was being raised, but not to, not to much avail, you know, so I congratulate you. And you are the first MP to push for public petition. So, so tell me, Louis, how much of your, of your ad advocacy work uh, in ACRES do you think prepared you to be a member of parliament? And, and fight for causes, how much of it? And, and what's the kind of impact that it has had? I mean, it's obviously trained me up. I mean, you know, when I entered politics, everybody said that activists cannot be entering politics. How can that be? And I've always said that a, a politician should be an activist. We're yeah, there. a politician somewhere else, but not in Singapore, being an activist. <laughs> I'm sure that you can be. I mean, I re-elected for my second term. We're there to mobilize people, uh, to bring them and change mindsets, get them supportive of the work that we do. It's exactly the same as what I did at Acres and what I'm doing in Parliament and in Nisun now. And have I, you? I, I mean, I've been trained up to speak up all my life in, in Acres and I speak up now in Parliament. Have you got yourself into trouble with, the, with your party for speaking up so vehemently? A yeah. rap on the knuckles? Well, I'm in my second term now. <laughs> yeah, but you could be badly bruised. I can't see. It's probably inside. No, you can't. The housefly is never bruised, remember? You can't get the <laughs> Okay, <laughs> talking about houseflies, right? Your, uh, yeah. Minister Shanmugam, he's, he leads your GRC. Um, and uh, he's, he's known to be uh, tough, aggressive, unrelenting, you know, as, as a fighter for things that matter to him. Um, now, has, has that rubbed off on you, that style? Or would you say that your style is different? I think it's different, although, of course, he's, he, you know, Minister Shamugam was the one who brought me into politics. And that was in... Do you think he saw something, something similar, bird, birds of a feather? You're going to ask him that one. <laughs> <laughs> but he was the one who brought me into politics, introduced me, uh, nurtured me, really trained me up. And um, over these last five years, has really supported the, I mean, the crazy things I do. Yeah. And, and has, he, has he supported you in speaking up right through? He has. I mean... And all the stuff, uh, all the work that I've done in Nisun as well, I mean, the different projects that I've, I've launched, 
uh, which may be different um, in another constituency. I think they has been very supportive of it, and I'm very grateful. And that's why I'm, you know, at first I was in Marine Parade. I think the all the media articles said I would be fielded there, and in the end I was put back to Nisun. I was very happy to come back to to serve in an area where I started my my journey. At. Apart from animal rights, Lewis, you 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 have. You have championed a few major causes, right? I mean, these are causes that are close to your heart. For example, uh, the whole issue of migrant workers. You know, uh, what, what accounts for your, your sort of attachment to the issues surrounding migrant workers? And what are some of these issues? Uh, so one of the first few things I did when I was elected back in 2015 was to uh, walk in their shoes. So I, I did quite a number of uh, different jobs where I got down on the ground and really experienced what the, the workers were going through. And one of it was a town council cleaner. And I worked with Hanif for a day and I got to experience what his life was, which was extremely difficult going and clearing out the rubbish bin, uh, how smelly the bin centre is. But at the same time, I saw how happy he was. It's a very strange thing that his back-breaking work, but he's full of smiles. Residents were... Uh, stopping to greet him more than greeting me, to be very honest. They, he was like the, the very popular person on the ground. Is he, I, the guy, is he the guy you went with to Bangladesh? Yep. Uh, for, so, yeah. Um, he told me, I think it was last year, the, two years back, I and mean, his wife Tanya came to Singapore to visit. Um, they obviously had fun. But a year later, he told me, yes, a, few, a month later, he told me <laughs> she's pregnant after she went back. Well, at least some foreigners are having some success in procreation. Pretty quickly, you know, within, I wouldn't say how long, but <laughs> until he told me his, his son was going to be born, and I thought, okay, why don't I go back to, to, with him to Bangladesh, to Dhaka, uh, and to welcome his son into this world. But that plan didn't work because the wife gave birth, Tanya gave birth early, but uh, we were back there. I mean, I got to meet his whole family. I called all my, uh, the cleaners in Nisun East, all their families uh, to join me for lunch in Dhaka, and that uh, for me, as I shared in Parliament, was really a heartwarming but heartbreaking experience. I, I mean, I saw them crying as they, they at that time, were still Skype. They were Skyping their, yeah, yeah. Uh, their family back home. Um, I met uh, Mazibu's daughter, who's now this year, eight years old, and she has never met her father in, in her life. And I, I cannot imagine, you know, my daughter was just walking past here just now. Yeah. I can't imagine not seeing her for her entire life. Yeah. And so they, they face that, the separation from their family. Um, I've been raising in Parliament about their living conditions, yeah. about the electronic payment of their salaries, about the work injury compensation. Uh, so these are issues I think are important that we raise up for the, the community who are marginalised. And so, they need their voice in Parliament as well. So how did the, 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 you know, the, the recent... Um, treatment of uh, foreign workers, migrant workers in Singapore. I mean, Singapore government has done a very good job upon realization of the plight uh, of the migrant workers. But in the first place, you know, uh, why did it happen? You know, so many of them, you know, having been exposed to COVID. Uh, what, what do you think we can as a society do to improve? I'm not talking just about COVID and so on, just at a macro level, at a fundamental level, what do you think as a society we can do better in the way we treat people who are from overseas who are here to help us? I think that was my, my maiden speech in Parliament, I mean, in this yeah. 14th Parliament, that we, we need to start removing the labels and to see people for just as that, fellow human beings. I mean, I used the quote that there is no us or them, only us, one human family connected in ways we sometimes forget. So they remove the labels that they're cleaners, that they're sex workers, that they're women, yeah. but to, to really remove that lens of discrimination. And I, I think that's why we, my focus was now on the hardware of this nation. For the migrant workers, the hardware, we're working on it, the improving their dorm situation, the software of our policies of electronic payment. Yeah. But now is how we can be more inclusive to people who build our homes, yeah. who help clean our workplaces, our playgrounds. So let me ask you, let me ask you this, Louis. I mean, I... There have been calls by different groups recently, um, especially after the COVID incident, that, you know, that there are migrant workers, migrant workers who have been living in Singapore for 15, 20 years, right? Uh, is it not possible for some of them to be considered for citizenship or PR? Should it be always based on economic considerations? These are people who clearly consider Singapore home. Why wouldn't we consider giving them these migrant workers uh, uh, you know, the privilege of becoming citizens. 
some of them are actually a lot more committed to Singapore than I, I would say even PRs that I've, I've met. What are your thoughts about this? So they can if they are on an S-Pass. But I get your point on why on a work permit they, they can't. Yes. But if they're on S-Pass, they can try to apply. Yeah, but why not extend it to, to work permit? Because, because regardless of your standing, because we, we, tend to, we tend to look at people according to socioeconomic strata. Actually, for citizenship, we should look at people according to commitment. You know? And clearly, they are adding value to society by doing, doing jobs that Singaporeans don't want to do. You know, so I, I particularly liked your maiden speech, by the way. You know, I, I thought it resonated with a lot of Singaporeans, mm. uh, you know, and you were, you were, you know, plain speaking um, in the way you put it across. Um, and I want to say that, you know, the, the, the problem in our society, if I may say, you know, and, and our government to some extent is responsible for this. I think we are, we, there are just way too many labels. You know, even in, in schools, you know, normal, you know, academic, normal, technical and so on. And these labels stick with you for life, you know. Uh, similarly, you know, single parents, you know, things like that. You know, these labels actually result in policies that may be, uh, may be discriminatory. What are your That's thoughts? That's what I've been fighting for. So same with the single parents. Uh, the single and wet, so as an example. Why do we discriminate that? Uh, because you're a single and wet, there's no housing available for you. There's no rental flat. Uh, there's no cash component or baby bonus. There's no parenthood tax rebate. Uh, there's no working mother's child relief. And I keep saying that, that we've removed the label and judged them as a parent. You know, we've, we've been saying that repeatedly now that, that there are parents regardless of whether they're married or not, regardless of their marital status. And there is a child involved. And in fact, that's my whole, uh, my whole parliament advocacy has been to remove these labels. You know, I delivered yeah. a speech on the sex workers as well. That, that's right. You know, we the massage establishment bill that we, we keep trying to play this cat and mouse game, trying to arrest them, I'm trying to prosecute them. But actually, and I sat down with the sex workers and you listen to their stories and you realize why they became a sex worker. Right. And that's why in that, that speech, I, I'm, I'm still amazed by her. I mean, she put a heart and soul into it, uh, left the sex industry, uh, went to do her diploma and she got straight A's in her first semester. And that's, that's what we can achieve if we start to give people a chance, uh, take away the lens of discrimination, a view a Singaporean as a Singaporean, and I, I think we'll get somewhere and get further in our society. If there's one thing you'd like to see change in the way Parliament works in Singapore, what would that be? More time for question. <laughs> More time for PQs? I've raised that, yes. Yeah, right now it's one and a half hours, right? One and a half hours, we get sometimes 10 questions out of the yeah. 70 over that's filed, and I, I mean, I've said it very publicly, I, I hope that they question time can be extended so that we can get through more of the, the questions that have been filed, and get through more debate as well. Because right. these are, I mean, all the questions are important. Yeah. Because there's some priority ones now and in terms of the, uh, the way it's ordered. But I, I really wish that more questions can be debated. Yes. Of course, selfishly, uh, more of my questions can be debated. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm sure. Actually, I think there are many Singaporeans who would like to hear more of your questions being debated because you do bring up questions that are pertinent. So that brings me to my, light, my, my final question. We have only about a minute and a half left. Now, uh, you know, some people say that you are posturing because you get a lot of media publicity because you raise these issues and therefore you could be guilty of playing to the gallery or being populist. Uh, what's your response to that, Lewis? I think I raise issues that matter. It's not whether it's uh, popular or not, but I've always used this quote, which is, I, if I have to choose between being liked or being hurt, I would choose being hurt. And that's my sense. I mean, the, the issues that I raise, unfortunately, has not been raised in Parliament for most of it. And I want to make sure that I'm there to give everyone a voice in Parliament. And that will, I mean, I always live by that. Thank you, Lewis. Thank you for what you're doing. And here's wishing you more time for PQs in <laughs> Parliament. So We'd like to hear your voice a lot more. And thank you and all the best, Lewis. Thank you. Same to you.